Hello, everybody. So uh, this week's lecture is about stairs, um, or we can also call it vertical circulation, but we're going to concentrate mostly on stairs. Other types of vertical circulation would be escalators, ramps, um, elevators, and things like that. But um, because we're concentrating mostly on residential applications, stairs are pretty important to understand how to design. And we really can't design our stairs until we are able to get um, realistic uh, distances or heights from levels to levels, which is why we did um, our floor framing first and then our wall sections. So then that informed us of what our distances from our different levels are going to be based off of realistic construction. Um, so once you've got your wall section complete, then you should have a distance from your um, finished floor of your Josephine down to the basement and uh, you could design your stairs for instance. Um, the stairs I've already drawn for you for this project but I want you all to know how to do this and I want you to know what the rules are for um, stair construction. So um, the first thing we're going to do is look through um, examples of some things that are considered stairs. Um, this would be called loft stairs or a ladder, and this one has offsetting uh, uh, steps up for each each foot. So you can see that we can um, kind of get away with getting a lot more risers in, in a smaller space. These would not be considered egress stairs, however. Egress stairs have to be of certain size, width, and a rise to run ratio for them to meet the requirements of um, an escapable set of stairs. You can have loft stairs like this if all you have above um, is a space that is strictly for sleeping or it is open space that's above another, um, uh, it's, it's raised level that's above existing floors uh, in a, in a space, so like an attic space that you want to have access to that just maybe has a railing and you throw a bed up there, or if you were to create, for instance, a loft structure inside of a, a, a house or a structure that has really high ceilings, then you could create a loft structure with a ladder to that loft structure, and that's allowed. You can't have stairs like this, though, going up to a whole full second floor of a house and call that good. Um, the code enforcement officer would not allow that. So we're going to talk about what type of stairs those kinds of stairs need to be, the egress stairs in particular, so that you understand those code compliances. Um, I have these fun pictures because they just show some additional ways that you can um, um, think about stairs like one of my favorite ones is this one right here which is making use of the um, the space underneath some of these first few steps and putting some drawers in there for uh, shoes what a great idea um, this just shows some beautiful design solutions for the newels and the um, and the railings and the hand railings this is a gorgeous uh, example of um, a handrail that could be used in a residential application. Um, some of the way this is designed would not be um, safe necessarily for children. Um, and we'll talk about how the stairs um, and how they get designed in um, a residential application. There's a lot of rules, but a lot of times those rules cannot be um, uh, reinforced once the owners move into the house and start using it. I'm sure all of you have experienced or seen a house where you go in and the, the, there's no railing system and there's no guardrail or anything on the stairs because that maybe when the family moved in they took the railing down to move the you know furniture up on the second floor and then just never bothered to put it back up again. Um, nobody's going to walk into your house and say we need we demand to see your stairs right now and see if they meet code but what will happen is when those owners go to sell the house, um, when an inspection is done, that railing would have to be put back. So those railings that I'm talking about and handrails and things like that, we're going to talk about what those need to look like. Uh, with commercial construction, by the way, it's a lot stricter because those um, the fire chief or whoever it is that's uh, making sure that things have been done to code can walk through the building at any time and check to make sure um, things are, are to compliance. A little different when we're talking about residential. So here's some examples of uh, some really interesting stair um, solutions. 
This one I love because this is another example of an attic stair, maybe going up into an attic um, that maybe is a, you know, a loft office space or something like that. But what a great way to use all the storage around here for books. Obviously somebody who is an avid reader. And this is the same set of stairs looking down from the up above in the attic space. This is a set of spiral stairs with a slide. Um, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> This is not necessarily going to be seen in any kind of residential application in most situations, but it sure looks like it's a lot of fun to um, to escape from our second floor that way. These are real uh, commercial sets of stairs that are in a commercial structure that do meet 100% uh, meet the compliance of um, safety codes for stairs in a commercial application. Um, they are uh, commercial application step riser and tread height is 711. It's a good thing to remember. That's the minimum um, tread depth is 11 and the maximum riser height is allow allowed is seven inches. Um, by the way, the minimum riser height is four inches and the maximum tread depth is two feet. Anything beyond two feet is starting to seem like it's a landing and it needs to be a minimum of three feet if you do that. So these are the typical 7-Eleven stairs that we see in most um, commercial applications. And then we have what's called a guard and a handrail. And here the guard is a plexiglass sheet making it seem a lot more open and um, less uh, uh, um, visually obtrusive. Um, but it's doing the same thing that a guard is supposed to be doing um, in commercial construction. A guard needs to be placed at 42 inches above the st step nosing, whereas the handrail needs to be at a height that's typical for um, uh, human factor hand positions while walking down the stairs. The handrail has to be a continuous um, uh, rail that uh, is uninterrupted so that someone walking can continue to hold that rail all the way down. Um, and that needs to be at a height of 34 to 36 inches. So there's two components with a commercial set of stairs that deal with safety from falling off the stairs, the guard and the handrail. With residential stairs, we typically only see the handrail. Here's another example of the um, offset foot step and an interesting kind of sculptural uh, design result. Here's a, a, a set of stairs that would meet the code requirements for the rise and run, but um, We'll see later on that uh, these would be called open risers. And so open risers um, can be somewhat dangerous for uh, small animals and young children because uh, they can fall through or uh, get their hands or feet or whatever stuck in between these spaces. But this is a beautiful example of uh, what seems like the stairs are just floating. They're obviously cantilevering and, and uh, being secured by the wall. Um, but uh, there shows us risers, the landing, and, and uh, a U-shaped set of stairs basically is what this is. Spiral stairs get used in residential and commercial. Um, and the spiral stairs have a, a slight different requirements for headroom um, because of their design. Um, you have to be able to pass underneath uh, one of the other revolutions. So the head height that we have here is not is a little bit less restrictive than the uh, straight or L or U shaped set of stairs. Here's another great solution to both getting to the attic and um, grabbing some storage is using the actual um, storage bins as our steps up to the attic. Great idea. And these stairs are really interesting in that they're hung from the ceiling here. So our first step up is floating and this is a uh, um, both a, a set of stairs going up and a set of stairs going down, whereas this is just one set of stairs. So I know these seem like, I think these are probably in the same um, uh, building, but they're two different uh, stairways. And this was a large enough tree that was um, um, installed in this uh, uh, retail place. And it was big enough that the stairs could be designed and carved out of the inside of the tree. And we can see it from the inside and the outside. So really interesting ways of, um, you know, solving that vertical circulation problem that we have. So let's go back one more here. Um, so I wanted to get into stair design and construction. The information that's shown in your um, um, building construction illustrated book. 
the information that you um, have about stair construction is under the chapter special construction. And you'll see um, uh, wood stairs is where I would start. And um, actually, let's start with stair design. So stair design at the first page, um, this talks about the um, the pitch basically of your stairs as you design them. So you've got ramps are very shallow. The uh, ADA compliant ramp is a 112 ratio, meaning for every a one foot that we travel horizontally, we can only travel one inch up. So to give you an idea, if I have um, a two foot difference in uh, gr from grade to our first floor, and I have to design a ramp that will be meet ADA compliance, that ramp would have to be 24 feet long because I'd have to have uh, one foot for every inch that I'm going up in a vertical direction, I'd need to have a foot. So that would be 24 inches for a two foot difference in, from grade to fir first floor. So that means my ramp would need to be 24 feet long. So ADA compliant ramps are very, um, uh, difficult to fit into locations and does get it designed right. Um, and uh, they need to be very strict in how they're designed. Um, so those are the, the strictest of ramps types. The other types of ramps that you're seeing here, 1-8 maximum is our for, you know, non-ADA compliant ramps or, um, you know, just a, a typical height that you'd want a ramp to be where it would be safe to push things up and down for um, maybe like uh, somebody that um, needs ramps for um, uh, commercial uh, deliveries and things like that. Um, your minimum riser is four inches. That's a tripping hazard or anything less than four inches. And um, then here is your seven inch, seven eleven rise that you get right here. So it's a Notice how much uh, shallower that is to a uh, residential rise of seven and three quarters by 10. And then a step ladder is at um, above a 45 degree angle. So I had a, a um, my grandmother lived in a Cape Cod house in Biddeford where the stairs were a nine inch rise and nine inch tread. So that's a 45 degree angle pitch for the ride for the stairs and they seemed really steep so a 45 degree angle um pitch for the nosing on the stairs is just it's a it's a very very high rise to run ratio um in that it's equal so at that 45 degree that would be an example of a 45 degree angle stair and you would feel that they're very steep so the best um ratio is the 7 to 11 ratio which is why it ends up being the requirement for uh, commercial projects as a minimum standard. And then this shows you your um, riser and tread dimensions uh, in keeping a, a uh, um, in keeping with certain ratios. So I want to get to the wood construction and handrails and things like that. So this is an example of a handrail. Um, the handrail is exactly that. It's been installed to allow for a continuous rail for someone to hold on to going up and down the stairs. And there are some dimensions that are here that are minimum dimensions that need to be used to in design that handrail. Um, what it looks like in section, how far away from the wall it needs to be and so on. Um, the uh, tread depth is measured from nosing to nosing. That's important to know. And your riser is measured from top of tread to top of tread. And your nosing, um, Protrusion is, um, in this case, because these are angled, uh, probably precast concrete stairs that we're seeing a pro profile of, that angle um, must equal a minimum of um, uh, a quarter of an inch, I believe, and a maximum of one and a half inches. And so this is another variation of that nosing. But we're gonna see what that nosing looks like in residential applications it looks like this. These are different stair designs and configurations. So we have L-shaped set of stairs, but this one's an L-shaped set of stairs with winders, circular stairs, spiral stairs. But this really shows and illustrates the typical residential construction for wood stairs. So these are stringers. 
Um, this is a landing. It's going to be framed very similar to a floor framing. You've got posts or um, um, walls that will hold up that landing. Then we've got stringers that have been notched so that they are pinned to that landing and then hung on the beam above. And we've got the three stringers. And then our finishes are placed um, on the face of the stringer for the riser and on the top of the stringer for the tread, creating the whole um, stair structure. This is called a, um, a, a, open, a closed stringer over here where we see that extra piece of wood. And then if we don't have that extra piece of wood, this is called open stringer. when We see the, uh, the actual um, stair shape from the side. Um, and this is a better example of what we would see for commercial construction for nosing and tread. Um, so you have your stringer itself right here. On top of that is the sub flooring, a sub uh, tread and riser that we're seeing. And then we have our finished floor on top of that, creating the whole stair system. And then this is a good side view of. Um, um, a handrail system that's built on top of a wall and capped. And then this is a rail system that's um, uh, mounted on a wall. And this is an example of open risers. And this just shows illustrations on how those newel posts are placed and framed into the tread. And Another example, too, of what a handrail profile could look like. Instead of the round profile, you can have all sorts of shapes that are more conducive to the, to, to the uh, hand grip that you have. So this is a good illustrations, really good illustrations of how wood stairs are constructed. Whoop. So I've got on the next page, I just have, um, whoops, going all over the place here. I just have some different um, uh, plan views that you would see for stairs. So one of the more important things to remember is that if I'm designing a set of stairs and it's a full set of stairs going from one level to another, you usually need at least um, 10 feet of uh, straight stair length that's exposed to um, uh, that the floor is cut out and open above it and then a landing. So that results in 13 feet that you need for a straight set of stairs. So let's say you have a 24 foot wide building. That would mean that if I put my um, uh, lally columns right at the 12 foot um, middle, middle of the 24 foot wide building, and I wanted to design a set of stairs going um, from the first floor, um, or from the basement rather, up to the second floor and hit that beam, the stairs wouldn't have enough room because it would only be 12 feet. I'd have to make them L-shaped. Um, so the only other way to fix that is to offset that beam and make it at um, 14 feet on one side and 10 feet on the other, and then I'd have enough room for a straight set of stairs. This is what a straight set of stairs could look like, and they do not necessarily be, need to be even on both sides of the landing. We can have um, alternating um, or like two steps and then a landing, and then the rest of the run is on the other side of the landing. Um, typically, I design my landings to be three feet, four inches, so that the width of the uh, stairs are three feet, four, four inches in both directions. I cannot make this less than three feet. I like the extra four inches because it gives you a little bit more room for moving uh, furniture and things like that up, up and down. Um, I have this here to show you the difference between what winders used to look like and what they have to look like now. So you see that in this example, we've taken the landing and cut it in half and created another second tread or riser here. So that allows us to have fewer, um, fewer space or less space being used up. We don't have to add another riser here. We've, we've divided that landing in two. This is not allowed anymore, however. We can't have what's called a zero depth uh, anywhere on the tread. The narrowest the tread is allowed to be is four inches, I believe. We'll, we'll go ahead and look at that under stair code explained here in a second. But this is what a winder looks like now where we have um, a little bit of thickness on the inside of those winders uh, and we can uh, we can then therefore have the stairs take up a little bit less space. 
So these are all L shapes, and then this is U shape, where we're going up the stairs, hit a landing, turn, um, and going uh, 180 degrees in the other direction and go continuing to go up the stairs. And this is the same U shape with winders, and then we have spirals. So those are the ones I wanted to kind of touch on. So let's go into stair code explained. And this is a linked PDF file that we have that um, has visuals on what all those stair codes are. Um, and this comes from a, um, actual international residential code requirements. So this is the legitimate, the legitimate code requirements for um, a set of stairs. So stairways um, have to be at least 36 inches wide. And then if you put handrail in there, the minimum clear width um, between the handrails cannot be less than 27 inches if you have handrails on both sides. That's what this is illustrating. And this, this is what it's saying here, and this is what it's illustrating. So this is a great document to really understand what is this rule really talking about? Because when you read through code books, they get very dry. And also you sometimes can say to yourself, what the heck are they talking about? And this does a great job of illustrating that. Headroom is measured from the nosing um, straight up six feet, eight inches. You can't have anything running into that plane. Um, if you have something running into that plane, it doesn't meet code. Um, some of you lived in, who live in older houses, like myself, I live in a house that was built in 1920. My stairs do not meet code. At um, one point in my stairs, I'm, I'm walking up and there's about five feet, eight inches of headroom. So I can pass through it without ducking, but my husband and my son have to duck there because uh, they're both taller than five feet, eight inches. And um, if they're not paying attention, they can, they can hit their heads. <laughs> so that's obviously not a good safe design to have in stairs. So the headroom height got moved up to six feet, eight inches, probably because a bunch of people knocked themselves out on the stairs and uh, those statistics got to the safety code officers and they came up with this new code compliance to make sure people weren't knocking themselves out on the stairs and uh, either dying or having to call an ambulance. So all of these codes and that we have to stay be compliant for are all based off safety um, in, for the most part or um, keeping a standard for uh, standard living quality for people, okay? Um, we get into stair treads and risers. This is a um, illustration similar to the one that you have in your book, but it is the one that um, also shows you what your variance is allowed to be. So greatest rise, smallest rise, the difference between those two uh, numbers cannot be more than three eighths of an inch. So you get, you're given a little bit of wiggle room, not much, um, so that when you design your set of stairs, uh, it's okay to be three-eighths of an inch difference on one set of stairs. So this is showing you the highest or tallest riser down here, seven and three quarters. The shortest one is seven and three-eighths. When you take the difference between those, it does not add up to be more than three-eighths of an inch. Our maximum riser is seven and three-quarters. So if this uh, first tread here um, or riser ended up being eight inches, technically these stairs wouldn't be compliant. All right, let's go a little bit further. Um, same thing with tread depth. There's a three eighths of an inch difference that you can have. And notice that the treads are measured from nosing to nosing. So from the nosing to nosing. The actual amount of foot space you have, if you were to measure from the inside of the, uh, the riser to the edge of the nosing, would probably be closer to 11 and a quarter inches. But we don't measure it that way. We measure the tread from nosing to nosing or from riser to riser, and you would get the same answer. This illustrates the example of what winders can be now, and it explains what the minimum dimension can be for the inside of the winder. Um, and I think it illustrates that, uh, let's see here. Um, one of these says how small it can be. Non-parallel edges. There it is, actually, it's six inches. So it's saying here, you can't have a tread that's less than six inches anywhere. Um, and then 
if you were to take a radius here at these points and I'll set that 12 inches in at that point where that radius crosses the treads, we should be able to measure at least 10 inches. And that's how that's how that's uh, winders have to be designed. So winders um, still they still take up a little bit less space, but not not um, as much as they used to, uh, they used to take up a lot less space than regular stairs did. And these are all, all uh, alternates for uh, winder design where we're creating some risers in that um, turning space rather than just having a landing. Let's back this up a little bit. Um, and this just gets into more detail about um, the pitch and angle of the riser and the pitch and angle that the tread is allowed to be and then what kinds of profiles need to be used um, as a, a tread end profile. So there can't be a, a perfect corner here. It either has to be chamfered or bullnosed, which is being shown here. Um, this is an example of an open riser. And lower steps in the open riser are fine. Uh, but as soon as we get up a certain height, uh, a test would be done to see if a four-inch sphere could fit inside of that riser and of course if that slat that they put here wasn't there then that would be a lot more than four inches and this is where children can fall in cats can fall off or uh, somebody can get stuck um, you know and, and in in be in a precarious position so they uh, will do this four inch sphere test for open risers like this And again, nosings um, have the size of a half an inch minimum to up to one and a quarter inch uh, that it protrudes. But that protrusion that you have for each riser um, and each nosing, I should say, cannot also cannot be any uh, different than three eighths of an inch. So let's look at landings and stairways. The landing has to be uh, three feet no matter what but it can be wider. So this is showing uh, the two different various stair widths. So uh, this happens sometimes you have a grander, wider stair at the base of the stairs in the first floor, and then it gets narrower as you go up the stairs. It still can't get any less than three feet wide, but you might have a landing that's three feet wide in one direction, but it would have to be matching the width of the stairs in the other direction. And this is showing your pitch that your rise, uh, tread rather can be a slope, I should say, no, no more or less than 2%. Um, this is if you have something other than square landings, what's, it's still the same. I still have to have 36 inches of clear open space from the center of where that, or the midpoint of that landing to the radius of it. Um, what is this one? Oh, this is discussing handrails. Where do you have to have handrails um, uh, to show uh, where handrails need to be? So this handrail is showing up on the inside edge of this wall right here. So you'd walk up and you can hold the railing on this side and then you can hold the railing going up the second flight. And these are your railing uh, rake height, uh, the uh, rail height that 34 to 38 inches so that's rail height for residential because we're also usually using this as a handrail as well um, and then a handrail height if it's wall mounted where where it has to be and what are the dimensions off the wall um, and how it has to be a continuous um, handrail that you can follow on the way down and then this just shows us uh, some clarification on um, uh, newel posts and interpretation of the um, code compliance for newel posts with handrails attached to it. Um, and these are all kinds of different finishing that you can have for those uh, uh, final newel posts. And this is expensive stuff too. This, this kind of uh, interior finishes are really expensive. And then some different handrail profiles. So that's the basics. And then we get into um, Spiral stairs, there's a difference in headroom and maximum riser height is different for spiral stairs. But this also explains the difference between a guardrail and a handrail or a guard. 
This is acting as a handrail and a guardrail at the same time with residential. It needs to be 34 inches minimum. It can be up to 38 inches. If we have a, a landing up here that's open and it's over 30 inches, then we need to put a balcony um, guardrail up there and that needs to be at least 36 inches. And sometimes it's designed as high as 42. Um, and these are the sphere tests that I was uh, explaining. Um, these sphere tests are to prevent basically children or babies and animals getting stuck inside of these spaces. And that's it. You get your definitions at the end. So um, that explains your code requirements. And the next steps are going to be um, how do we design a set of stairs? So this is a set of stairs, a, a typical straight set of stairs in section, what it might look like. So we have your guardrail up above. If it was open, let's say to the second floor, um, and we could see up there from the, the lower level, then we'd have a guardrail and be able to see up there. Um, and we'd have a continuous handrail uh, that we could follow going up to that second floor. Um, the opening that we put in the floor to be able to pass through that, that plane is uh, created by um, trimming some headers here and uh, trimmers uh, double joy, doubling up the joists on either side of the stairs and the lengthwise would uh, would in include what we'd have for framing. We can't see the the section beyond here, but we can see that where the two headers would be located would be ha uh, how we would define the opening in the floor. And it's usually based off of where the stringer is being hung here. And then uh, the other side is based off of where we can get that headroom of um, the six feet, eight inches. So this is showing the six feet, eight inches is measured from the nosing up. And we can see that we've clearly got all the headroom we need. In fact, we could probably pull these over a little further, um, pull, pull this opening in the second floor over a little further and we'd still be okay. As soon as I were to bring these headers over and pass this plane, this dashed line that's giving us the headroom, then it would be out of code. That would, that would mean that my headroom there would be less than six feet, eight inches. Um, our riser height, I think I must have done something to this. This should have said seven and um, three quarters. Uh, it's off by uh, one sixteenth, obviously, and so I must not have snapped to the exactly right uh, dimension, but that should be no more than seven three quarters and 10 inches. And these are the stringers. This is called the total run of the stairs, and this is the total rise of the stairs from level to level. Um, and I think I've covered everything there. So these are some stairs, what they look like in section and what they actually look like in 3D. So this is the L-shaped set of stairs. What does the opening look like? It's also going to be L-shaped to follow the stair shape. Um, this is another L-shape, but with winders. So you can see what that looks like. And then this is a U-shaped set of stairs. So that's usually a U-shaped set of stairs ends up being kind of more of a box um, uh, or square box that's uh, open to the entire stair. And then there's another U-shaped set of stairs. So see how that's a rectangular opening. Um, but this is one is with winders. And then spiral stairs will generally have a circular opening in the floor. So here's what you need to know to design stairs. Um, you need to know what total rise is. That's always gathered by measuring the distance from one level to the other. And it has to be either from subfloor to subfloor or from finish to finish. Um, you cannot do finish to subfloor or subfloor to finish. That doesn't work. So make sure that both of the um, levels that you're going to are either to both to the finish level or both to the subfloor level. And you should get exactly the same answer when you do that, um, by the way, because um, the finishes usually on each level are about the same thickness. Riser height is your a maximum riser height is seven and three quarters for residential and your minimum riser height is four inches. So you have to keep that in mind. Tread depths must be at least 10 inches deep and you can make them up to two feet wide, but that's it. If you make them beyond two feet, they're considered a landing and then they would not meet the requirements of a landing. Landing and stair widths must be at least three feet. 
Here are the equations we're going to be using to calculate those uh, riser counts and riser heights and uh, tread depths and tread um, our, our total run of the stairs. So to get riser count, you need to know what the total rise is first, and then you divide that by the maximum riser height that you're allowed. That's going to give you your minimum number of risers needed. Then to get riser height, you would take your total rise again and divide that by your riser count that you came up with by this equation. And then to get the stair run, you would take your tread depth times the tread count. Um, and the tread count, by the way, is always one less than your riser. So let's do an example problem. Um, here's a basement to the first floor. I want to design a stair that goes from the basement to the first floor. How would I go about doing that? The first thing I've got to do is um, figure out what that total rise is. So I can do that from the dimensions provided. Um, I've got seven feet, two inches to the top of the concrete wall, plus a one and a half inch mud sill, plus nine and a quarter floor joists. And then I know that this subfloor and finished floor are both three quarters of an inch thick. So my total rise ends up being eight feet, two and a quarter or 98.25 inches. To get my number of risers, I would take the 98.25 inches divided by 7.75 inches, and that gives me my, uh, that in that 7.75 inches is the maximum riser height, remember. To get my number of treads, I would take the number of risers minus one. To get my riser height, I take the uh, 98.25 inches again and divide by the number of risers I get for an answer up here. And then the total run is number of treads times tread depth. So we're going to see those equations um, come out over here. So number of risers is 98.25 divided by 7.75. I get 12.67. I have to round up to 13. Number of treads would be 13 minus 1 or 12 treads. So I know I have 13 risers now and 12 treads. My riser height. Um, would be determined by taking 98.25 and dividing by 13 risers. So that gives me 7.56 or 7 and 9 sixteenths inches for each riser. My total run is 12 treads times 10 inches or 120 inches or 10 feet. Whoops. So I've got all the information I need right now to be able to design and build those stairs, either in section or to do a, um, a uh, detail. OK, so let's do another example. Now that we understand what we're doing, let's pretend we're designing the stairs from the first floor to the second floor. Again, we have to take the information that we have in this um, section view and decipher it. So our total rise would be 8 feet 6 inches. And that 8 feet 6 inches is going from finished floor to finished ceiling. That's important to note. Where does that dimension co come from and go to? So I'm going to measure from finished floor to finished floor by adding up the dimensions that I have in this section view. 8 feet 6 inches gets me to the finished ceiling. Half an inch thick gypsum wallboard plus three quarters of an inch strapping plus seven and a quarter inch two by eight plus three quarters of an inch subfloor and three quarters of an inch uh, finished floor. I realize there's no line here to show the difference between sub and finish. It just must have gotten erased accidentally. But anyway, if we add those up, we end up with nine feet, four inches or 112 inches total rise. This is an important number for us to use. That's the number we're going to use for all of our equations. It's much easier to work in inches. Our number of rises net risers can be determined by taking 112 inches divided by 7.75 inch max riser and I get 14.45 or I have to round up to 15. So I have to have at least 15 risers to be in code compliance for this egress stairs. My number of treads is always one less, so I've got 15 risers, 14 treads, and my riser height will be 112 divided by 15 or 7 and 7 sixteenths. Total run would be 14 treads times 10 inches or 140 inches or 11 feet 8 inches. So I have all the information I need and I've calculated everything I need for a set of stairs that will meet egress requirements. 
So um, I've also, I, re I pre recorded this video, so I'm not going to play it here, but um, the, the next thing you would do is uh, um, go into um, the uh, YouTube channel link that I have that shows you how to actually draw out those stairs. And this will walk you through the steps of doing that. And that will take it full, full circle. So um, I'm going to let you all watch that on your own. But the concepts here, the most important ones to take away from are um, how do I calculate stairs? What do they look like in section and in plan? And uh, this is going to show you how to actually lay out a set of stairs in section and then use that information to project a plan view of those stairs once you've done all of that design work.